Hi, everyone. My name is Oliver. I lead the applications and innovation at Akoya Biosciences. And I'm going to follow up Grady today by talking to you about single cell spatial phenotyping. This is our concept that we have at Akoya and that fits in the many applications um, that you can use this system for. What you see on this slide is advanced breast cancer, a stage two adenocarcinoma, been imaged with a codex system. Tissue is about two millimeters from bottom to top, 3.6 millimeters from left to right. And what you can see are four different labels. Now I'd like to start my discussion just by showing you this image and reminding you the codex is optical imaging based and uses epifluorescence imaging to detect signals. Hence, we have single cell resolution. Very nice. You can see a nucleus right here. If you can see my cursor, you can see a nuclear envelope in red, which is laminin B1. And you can see ECAD heron, which is presumably the plasma membrane of the cell. So not only with codex do you have the ability to large image large intact whole tissues, but you can do so at single cell resolution. And then as Grady has alluded to, of course, you can do cyclic imaging of many myomarkers on a single tissue. So as you can see, the slides are advancing. We're always looking at the same tissue, but we're always looking at different marker combinations. These are toggling down here on the bottom. Each time you're looking at five to seven different markers on the same tissue, but each time you're seeing a very, very different biology of this tissue. That is codex, that is codex single cell spatial phenotyping. You have single cell resolution. Some cases you can go down to subcellular resolution and you can look at your tissue with up to 40 or more biomarkers. Now, how does this concept of single cell spatial phenotyping work? Essentially what we do is we register every cell by multi-parameter segmentation. So you can see as I'm going back and forth, here's your actual image, the actual fluorescence image, and here's a segmentation map. Every cell has now been registered as an object. What happens once you register every cell as an object, of course, you can start to catalog it. Every cell has a number. And this particular tissue, there are 63,000 cells. Each cell will be labeled with a combination of antibodies. This particular experiment, once again, we label with 36 antibodies. Every antibody will label every cell with a unique combinatorial um, pattern. So or each, each cell will be labeled with these antibody combinations and unique combinatorial patterns. Cell one, for example, will be labeled you know, somewhat with um, antibody one, but not with antibody two. Cell two will be strongly labeled with antibody one and somewhat with antibody two and so on and so forth. These data are analogous to data that you get, say, in single cell sequencing or even a flow cytometer. The difference in codex data, of course, are you to have you have XY coordinates. You know where every one of your, you know where every one of your cells is in X and Y. So this you can see here for 36 biomarkers, 63,000 cells. Now, what we do is we use clustering of data. In this um, experiment, we used um, unsupervised algorithm to cluster your data into different phenotypes. With the data that I had I just shown you, we were able to identify 12 different phenotypes. You can see these here on this Tisney map. Every dot is a single cell and every color represents a different cell phenotype. That was identified via clustering. You can see a very large contingent here of sort of green cells. Those will be luminal cells, a type of epithelium. Down here in blue, you have a, another type of epithelium. Up here will be vascular cells. I know these things because I've, I've looked at these data many times over. But what I would like to point out to you is, is this small contingent here of a red and orange cells. Out of the 63,000 cells in this experiment that we had looked at, 546 of them are so-called basal cells. These were identified with codex. Now 546 of 63,000 is 0.8% of the total population. That's a pretty small amount. Even better, there are 44 luminal cells in this particular tissue. That's 44 out of 63,000 cells. That's 0.07% of the entire cell population. Now you can see an example of these luminal cells right here. So this is an epithelium, so secretor epithelium, and nudged in here are these three little cells. There are a couple more over here, and here and there you see additional ones. How can we identify these? Well. Evidently, via clustering, the algorithm picks them out. You can look at a heat map and you can see that these luminal cells, for example, they express TFAM, 
Whereas basal cell, which will be probably the next, the, the next most similar cell, if you want it that way, does not express TFAM. On the contrary, the basal cell expresses TP63, whereas the luminal keratin A14 cell does not. Beta containing is labeling these cells, but not this one. So you can go through your heat map and you can look at it. And this is, again, very similar to something that you would do in, say, single cell um, RNA sequencing. We are basically looking at the outputs of clustering runs, and you're trying to make sense of it, trying to see whether or not a cell is there. The nice thing about this experiment, the codex experiment, though, is you have visual confirmation. You can actually see your cells. Here's three of them there, a couple dozen up here. There's a couple more here and here. You can actually see the cell. You have the clustering data, you have the heat map, you have the cell right in front of you. You can touch it almost. There you go. This is single cell spatial phenotyping. It's one way of looking at your tissue down to the single cell level with a high biomarker plex and even being able to identify the very rarest cells. There's a single one of these cells here, three of them over here, a couple I pointed out here. This is incredibly granular, incredibly detailed way of looking at your tissues. This is an application that can be done in any type of tissue for any type of biology that you're interested in. It's very reliable, clean detection of different cell types. So one of the other things then to touch on is what do codex data look like? You know, what does single cell codex data look like? And I'm just gonna give you a primer on this. What you can see here is, is another different codex experiment than we've done. In this case, we labeled a human tonsil with 39 different biomarkers, or antibodies. Each one of these images shows you a representation of this very same tonsil. Each time it's labeled with different antibody combinations. You can see here, for example, this panel, a lot of B cells labeled with CD20. You have the T cells outside of these sort of circular follicles or, or proliferating regions for the B cells. And IDO1 labels yet another structure in this tonsil. So the data add up nicely. They're nice to look at, but they just have a wealth of information here. Now, assuming your experiment works out nicely, what you do next, or what we like to do next, is we like to have good tools and able to make sense of them. For that, we go back to tools that are being used by um, single cell biologists all over the place. In this case, we look at protein co-expression. For example, here, you can see all of the 39 biomarkers in the experiment that we've conducted juxtaposed with 39 biomarkers from the same 39 biomarkers. And when you have this diagonal red line, basically that means you have perfect co-expression of a biomarker. Hence, a cell that expresses CD45 rho should also express CD45 rho, and therefore it's red. But if you look down, if you walk down this diagonal line, you get to see these, these, these boxes, basically. And each one of these boxes kind of tells you that a cell that, for example, is expressing beta catenin is also likely to express E catherin, which is in this line, or pancytokerin. And within this box, you realize that all of these are different epithelial markers. So you get a squeaky clean cost correlation of epithelial markers. Vascular markers, same thing. Nice little box, CD31, CD34, collagen, SMA, and so on and so forth. These are real codex data, about 350,000 cells in a tonsil. Cross-correlation works really nicely. The T cells up here, the vasculature here, you have B cells here, epithelial cells. This is one way that you can analyze your codex data. Now, of course, and I've just already shown you some clustering runs, once you have your data, once you have it analyzed, once you have the QC done and you think that your expression patterns are looking good, you can cluster your data. And what we have done here, we clustered data from a tonsil. Identified approximately a dozen different cell types. You can see them here. We'll tell you how many of them there are, about 2% fibroblasts, some macrophages, myeloid cells. And then over here, you can see how these different biomarkers are expressing. So this, for those of you who don't know, this is a UMAP. So this is a reduced dimensionality representation of all the cells, once again, in your tissue. Each dot is a cell. Each color indicates the cell type. Yellow, for example, your natural killer cells. Green, your B cells, and so on and so forth. You can compare that to the actual expression patterns of the markers on your UMAP, where red is hot and blue is cold. So for example, IDO1 
expresses very strongly here. You can go back to your map and you'll see that this is a type of epithelial or T cell, depending on what color this is and so on and so forth. So this is not too much different from what you'd be used to if say you're doing RNA-seq. But where it gets really different and really exciting with Codex is the idea that you can actually take these cell phenotypes now, these are the cell phenotypes we've seen, and you can map them back on a tissue. So what you see now here is a piece of breast tissue again. So um, secretor epithelia here, these sort of rose shaped regions, and these ducts or lines here are, are the collecting ducts where the fluids get um, collected. Now I'm not showing any microscopic image. What I'm showing here is a phenotypic map where each dot, each color is a cell of a certain cell type. T cells, dendritic cells, endothelial cells, fibroblazes, and mass. Now, if you look at that a little bit more closely, you can see it's quite a jumble of different cells. Generally, you have a lot of luminal cells, secretor epithelia, surrounded by basal cells, but there's also a contingent of immune cells inside of this breast. And here's where really this type of single cell biology differs from all other types of single cell biology. That is that we know the connectivity of every cell with every other one. It is very easy to draw this map. It's very easy to know that this cell is you know, many dozens of connections away from this cell and then so on and so forth. But having these data now allows you to look at your tissue and to ask questions that you've never really asked before. For example, we find um, T rags or CD4 T cells in the breast tissue. This will be this little red cell right here. What we've done is we've gone around and we asked throughout the breast tissue, if you find a single T cell, CD4 T cell, what is the likelihood that it will identify another T cell? And there is a certain neighborhood cluster. There's a certain part of the breast tissue that the likelihood's quite big. And that will be cluster number one. This is what you can see here. Each time here, you can see a T cell, CD4, that is surrounded by a bunch of different C cells. This is an actual neighborhood that exists in this breast tissue. It's a place where a CD4 T cell is quite likely to um, encounter another CD4 T cell. On the contrary, there are other CD4 T cells that are falling outside of this area, and they are more likely to encounter CD8 T cells. Now, these patterns may relate to the density of a certain cell type, may to the makeup of tissue, all kinds of things, However, what is probably clear and that we are really starting to follow up on nowadays is that no matter what the bi biological basis of, of these organizations is, the functional implications of these are very important because a T cell that is located to a like T cell will behave different than a T cell, for example, that is located to an epithelial cell that's expressing PDL1. These are very, very different scenarios. And they very much decide on what this T cell ends up doing at the end of the day. So analyzing these types of neighborhoods is something you can very easily do with the Codex experiment. And if you have never heard about this before and, and you're interested in it, I encourage you to read this paper by um, Christian Schuch and Gary Nolan. Um, this came out late last year. <clears throat> and I think this was the first time that, that, that this concept has been um, introduced. And they do a really nice job here in, in showing how these types of neighborhoods can really relate to different patient outcomes in say colon cancer. A really cool paper. Um, and I think this is sort of really the, the study that has grandfathered this approach of these cellular neighborhoods. So that's just one example that um, of an application that you can do with codex um, imaging. So you can do cell phenotyping just like you're used to from all the other applications that we see nowadays. But now instead of just knowing which cells are there and how many cells are there, you can ask all kinds of new questions like, who are they neighboring with? How may they interact with? And ultimately, how could this affect or, or, or relate to um, a patient outcome or a certain type of disease? So I don't have a lot of time and I'm gonna just wind up this um, little segment of mine with um, sort of a section on open codex applications. So I gave you a sort of a conceptual overview of, of what you can do but I'll give you a much more practical overview of, of three examples that certainly you can do as well. Obviously, codex is for whole tissues. Now, I'd like to emphasize this once again. When you take a codex experiment, you're imaging continuous a whole tissue. You can do 12 by 12 millimeters on our current cover slip. That's a big piece of tissue. So there are no ROIs. You're not restricted to predetermined ROIs or post hoc analysis of certain ROIs. 
you have the whole tissue at your disposal at single cell resolution. That's definitely one of the strengths of this approach. You can also do tissue microarrays. Well, you can see here, these are biopsies from lung tissue and we're imaged in a codex experiment. Now this isn't the entire experiment. In total, what we did in this experiment was something like 54, 54 cores. I'm showing, uh, I think a fraction of these, but it's just as easy to image tissue microarrays as it is to image a whole tissue. The only limitation, the only rule here is you need to be able to fit them on your cover slip. Lastly, you can even image cell cultures and organoids. What you see here is a neuronal cell culture. These cells were grown directly on the cover slip. They were fixed and then they were labeled with antibodies and processed for our imaging experiment. The cells did not wash off. We were able to look at this culture with I think 36 different antibodies, seeing things that we never really seen before. See here glia, see neurons, see all kinds of connectivity between different parts of the culture that we had never really understood. We don't even understand them yet, but we've never even seen them before. So the application range of codex is essentially anything you can image, you can do your codex experiment with. Now I just ask you to imagine, okay, I've done IHC with three markers for much of my career. What am I gonna do with 42 markers? What am I gonna ask? What question am I gonna ask? How am I gonna phenotype my cells? How many cells are there? Where are they? How are they interacting with each other? These are questions that we ask with codex. And once again, any tissue, any organ that can be imaged in principle can be used for codex. We've done this on melanoma. We've worked with brain tissues, human FFPE post-mortem, I should say, which are very difficult to image, but they work just fine on codex. Lung, skin, gut, kidney, even um, dissociated blood cells, spleen and breast, you name it. We've tried it. And so far, this has been an incredibly versatile system. And I hope you find a use for it. I hope you found this exciting. Um, and we're happy to um, address any questions that you have. Please contact your local reps. Thank you very much.